everyone who joined us today. This is Carolina from Time Camp, and you are listening to the new episode of It Works on My Machine. So this podcast is featuring leaders from the outsourced software development industry, where we find out how to grow and thrive in this environment uh, through their experience, tips, and some tricks. Our guest of today's episode is Anthony Vernon. He's a director of sales development and marketing departments at Outsource. He'll not only help us to understand the processes of sales better, but he'll also speak about how it works on the Outsource machine. So let's jump right in. Hi, Anthony. How, how is it going? I'm good, Carolina. How are you? I'm good as well. I'm so glad to meet you finally here. I'm glad you came here and I'm so excited uh, to, to, to hear what this conversation will bring us. So uh, let's start from the uh, very simple but yet very important thing uh, about you, about the introduction of you. So tell us a few words about yourself and your professional background. Okay. Um, my name is Anthony Vernon. Uh, I live on the west coast of the United States. Uh, in Portland, Oregon, um, but I grew up and I'm from Ireland, so obviously European um, for mo- and lived there for most of my life. And that's where my professional background started. Um, I started off as any many young people do in a part time job selling branded clothes, you know, um, part time, tw- 20 hours a week. Um, but my first real professional job was actually a business that I had myself and I started uh, selling advertising and media space to local businesses in Edinburgh, Scotland. And that's where I really learned how to sell because I didn't know what I was doing. So I just made it up as I went along, but I had to just cold call people. I had to walk in to shops. I had to walk into restaurants. I just walked the streets and just knocked on doors and walked into businesses and offices and just sold advertising and media space Um, and did that for about two years, maybe two and a half years. And from there, I ended up doing a lot more consulting work on sales and marketing because people were interested to see how I started that business and just started asking me about how I did it and why I did it and ended up getting consultancy work for digital marketing and um, selling. I actually ended up leaving Scotland and went to Ireland back or back home and started selling computer-aided design, so complex manufacturing and architectural design products, Autodesk, SolidWorks, um, and asset management solutions. Uh, so that was working across the what's called the built environment space, so construction companies, design firms. Um, and a lot of engineering and manufacturing firms. And I travel all across Ireland doing that. I was um, leading the West Coast initiatives, but also the account management for major, or the major accounts of the business as well. Um, I was also involved in some of the higher level deals, selling asset management solutions. Um, not too many of them, but some of them. So they were selling to people like uh, Eli Lilly, Biomarin, some big, big pharmaceutical companies all over Ireland. From there, I ended up deciding to quit because I wanted to travel the world. And the company were very nice. They offered to keep my job open for a year, even if I wanted to travel. So I traveled across the United States. I went to Fiji. Then I went to New Zealand and found a... This was pure chance, but I ended up meeting our emailing a company that that had just raised seed investment uh, from a from an, a private equity and I ended up being I think employee number six or employee number seven and helped that company go to market you know help them develop the product market fit selling their SaaS solution all across New Zealand helped sell it into Australia helped sell it into Europe flew all over the United States to talk and go to conferences. I gave speeches. I went to universities and gave lectures on the type of software we were selling, health and safety software. So I gave some small lectures on health and safety technology. Um, I helped launch that product in the United States as well. 
and that product's still going. You know, it's still running, it's still selling, and they're doing pretty well. Um, from there, then I moved to the United States because I met my wife, and she wanted to come home to the U.S. And from there, I ended up moving to Portland. Um, but I'd already visited Portland when I was traveling the world, so I knew that it was a good location, and it was pretty similar to Ireland in terms of the weather, which I liked. So, and then I started leading the the, uh, the business development and the sales for our, the marketing and sales elements for a company called Altsource, which is a local company in Portland. Um, they sell custom software. So it's software, but it's it's a services-based sale. Um, and it's a much higher deal value than SaaS products that I've been selling before. So the, the deal values are much more complex. The deal values are higher. The average contract value is bigger. So it's, uh, it's a more complex sale. And you're actually not selling anything tangible, so it's harder. And that's where I am now. I'm still doing that. Interesting. Like you went all in uh, right from the beginning of your sales journey. Uh, you had all of these little connections, such as in physical, like in real life with people, which is, um, gets, I mean, more and more rare <laughs> with every year with yeah. all of these software companies around, like tech companies uh, rising um, every day, basically. And uh, yeah, so uh, the outsource, uh, how is it different? I mean, working in bigger company like this in a soft outsourcing, outsource software development industry uh, from, let's say, the experience you had um, where you could, uh, where you had to walk uh, through all the doors and, uh, you know, pitch yeah. your uh, service and, or your, your work basically to people in, in real life. Uh, yeah, so tell us about this. There's a lot of differences in terms of the seal, but there's also a lot of similarities. I know that sounds odd because you're going door to door and knocking on the door and it sounds pretty easy. But there's also a lot of obviously major differences. The differences are there's more stakeholders involved in the decision process. Um, when you're buying an out, a, a custom software project, very often you are needed you need to sell internally that is that it's the right move to to do um because not everyone wants to go that way because they associate it with being long and complex and difficult and it might go it might go badly so you need, usually need to get four or five people involved from the customer side to sign off and agree and unless you're dealing with the owner and uh but very rarely it's, it's usually the cto or coo or the head of sales or head of marketing who wants this to launch this new product but in the same vein there's also a lot of trust building um, when you're because you're not selling anything tangible you can't see it <laughs> you know it doesn't exist yet so when i was knocking on doors it's the same thing they did they couldn't see their advert in my newspaper or they couldn't see their advert in on a digital platform yet they had to trust that we were going to create it and it was going to be um, the way they wanted it to be. So in, for me, that was all about trust building and relationship building, but also taking the risk out of the decision for the customer was a big element of it. So with Altsource, we really try to focus on the concept of have we done this before? You know, it's, a, it's much easier to tell a story that's similar to the customer's current situation than trying to convince somebody of something that we haven't done before and just just trust us we'll do it we'll do it well um so that's something we lean into quite a bit and i had to do the same thing we were not when i was knocking on doors i had to show comparative tell comparative stories have my case studies well documented and be able to be able to be a really good storyteller and to do that you need to know your use cases and um previous or similar case study and be able to map out the process for the customer in terms of this is what will happen at this point this is what happened at this point this is what will happen at this point and this is what will happen at this point and be able to clearly articulate so the customer knows where they are in the journey you know i've given you over my scope of work these are my requirements when will i get it back how much is this going to cost what's the timeline going to be um so there was a lot of that that was similar i know to the door-to-door -door, um because it was, it was an intangible product or intangible thing that they could touch. So I had to take the risk out of it for the customers, a big element of it. 
Um, but the differences, as I mentioned, is definitely the complexity of the sale. Like there's more stakeholders involved. And then also the deal value. You know, when I was selling advertising space, it was 500 bucks <laughs> for, for an advert. Um, whereas with custom software, it can be 100,000 to a million dollars. So get, getting somebody to part way with that amount of money is obviously much, much more difficult. So your targeting has to be on point. Your qualification has to be stricter because there's not as many people who can spend that amount of money. Whose problems do you solve as outsource yep. uh, as a company? So if you would like to give us more details on that. Yep, absolutely. So we focus on three main sectors. Um, we tried to previously to sell to lots of sectors, but it's very difficult to, to be to sell to everybody. Um, it's just, especially with an intangible product. <laughs> so you could, because you're basically selling everything that anything, we can do anything that, and that's not a sellable proposition. So we started, when I joined, we started narrowing down who we sell to. So we sell to the industrial sectors, which is like oil and gas, manufacturing, construction, anybody in the industrial economy, transport, logistics, stuff like that. Then we have another sector called financial service, or BFSI, which is bank, banking, financial services, and insurance. And then the third sector is what we call the digital economy, which is like e-commerce, um, SaaS, and uh, online technology companies, stuff like our wearables, like wearable technologies as well. We try to focus on the large, small businesses and small, medium businesses segment. And the reason we do that is because we can't go too small, otherwise they can't afford to pay for the service. And we can't go too big because we're we're not, we want to focus on partnerships. We want to help companies who have problems hiring internal teams, but not just hiring the team from a labor perspective. And we really focus on helping a customer map out their technology journey. What is their technology roadmap? What's their technology strategy at a high level? And how are we going to help support that from a custom software development perspective? to make sure that what we're building and helping support supports their business growth or supports their business goals, whether it be risk management, operational efficiency, growth, or, or a growth initiative. There's a lot of outsourcing firms that, you know, just build code that, to spec, you know, they'll get a requirements sheet and hand it over to their developers and they'll code it. We do a much more thorough technology roadmap upfront in the pre-sale, so it's longer, to ensure that we can help support the growth of the product in market. So if you're building in a mobile app, it, it only works if you're going to get signups. So we want to take that into uh, con context, you know, who's going to sign up, what are the users, what's their mon the, the journey, how are you going to monetize this, um, how are you going to get product market fit, how are you going to scale it, how is it going to work with the rest of your technology infrastructure and the rest of your growth, what's your sales strategy, all of those sorts of things, as well as building the product. So that's where we focus. We help companies who want to lead initiatives like that, and that really leans into our partnership model. Um, so we can support that with our business, uh, solution architects, business analysts, product managers, and that's where our differentiator is. Cool. So uh, since you touched the topic of your ideal customer profile a little bit and like told us about the uh, spheres you are targeting, so like these three big industries uh, you're focusing right now on, uh, do you think it will evolve with time? I mean, do you think you will expand to uh, some more industries or if, if so, what industries do you think these will be? Or maybe you have already started working on that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we do work with other industries. We just don't target them specifically, um, but they might come to us organically. And we're pretty upfront with them saying we don't have as much experience in that industry, but this is what we can offer you. We are looking at other industries, um, but what we want to do first is test, test the product market fit, test our, the viability of what we sell in that market. Look at the competition, Look for gaps, uh, and we do a thorough competitive business analysis, strategic analysis of every sector we go after to make sure that it fits with our brand, but also make sure it fits with our ability to scale and deliver. So we look for, we try to make sure that we've got some level of experience in that sector. 
with a, with some developers or some of our product managers or solutions architects to make sure that we have a really good compelling pitch up front without having to tell them we're going to learn this. We're going to learn your industry on the job. We don't want to say that. That's not a sellable, pro- it's not a very good sellable proposition. So we'll, to, to go into a new market, we'll strategically pick one or two, try and get a test project small that will be up front with the customer and say, this is, you know, um, this is new to us. We're um, going to try and we'll do a small project for you, learn. And once we do that and complete it, then we'll take that case study and take it, then take it to market in a more full scale, multi-channel approach. We'll put it on our website and send, send email campaigns and test it at scale before we would do anything. So that's how we, we would test a new market. We are looking at others such as you know, life sciences is a big a big market that I think we could be tapping into, like healthcare, life sciences. Um, the reason I say that is because a lot of, I think, I can't remember the exact number, but I think over 50% of uh, government R&D goes to biotechnologies. And that's usually a good indicator for the future of where the economy is going in terms of global competitiveness. And that's where a lot of tech dollars are going to make American businesses more competitive globally, um, protect their developing industries. And so I think there's gonna be a lot of money in that space going forward, but and a lot of complexity. You know, if you're dealing with bio companies or pharmaceutical companies or uh, complex healthcare companies, there's a lot of data privacy concerns, individual medical care plans, a lot of the regulations a lot of experimentation, and all of those will require some level of techno- um, technology investment. They're going to ha- require some level of customization, I would suspect. Uh, we've also looked at others such as um, hospitality um, for supporting their online growth, you know, their ser- ability to deliver services online. Um, it's not a something we've went deep into just yet, but it's certainly something we could get into going forward. But I, I see the big market for us as healthcare, life sciences, pharmaceuticals in the next two or three years, for sure. Amazing. Thank you for sharing like the framework you are sticking to when it comes to uh, exploring some new markets, some new uh, sectors, and of course, uh, by finding where you will find your potential customers uh, who you cooperate in future. But uh, let's come back to the uh, basic processes you are using in sales. And Anthony, Tell us which sales channels do you use to reach your prospects uh, in all of the sectors uh, you mentioned. And out of all of these um, channels, uh, what do you think are the best performing ones? So we have three main channels at the moment. Um, Well, four really, but two of them are kind of similar. And I'll explain that in a second. Um, The four main channels are email marketing, inbound lead generation from organic search and inbound content creation. And then also something we call pay to play. So basically we have marketplaces for solution seekers who they post a project description, their budget, location, what they want to achieve. And then we as the solution uh, provider can bid not for the project, but bid to get a meeting with the project seeker. Uh, project seeker. So we have a channel um, like that, which is working really well for us. Um, but they all, each channel has a different function. Um, and there are other channels we will explore in the future, but we don't have enough resources to execute them well. But email marketing, we do from a cold email outreach program. So cold lists, like download your list, segment, segment it into different campaigns, different personas, different industries develop your messaging, create it against the ICP, put it in the personalization sequence, et cetera, et cetera. And we just, we scale that up. Um, that's a really low cost way to generate new leads and new meetings for us. It's been our most successful channel and the most efficient um, in terms of scale. So we get X, like over 20 meetings a month from that channel. So you can do that in two approaches. You can do an ABM approach, which is more one-on-one, very targeted, a lot of research, super personalized. 
you need a lot of time, labor to do that. And it can be, if you get it wrong, it can be catastrophic because if you don't have other channels working and that's your only channel that you want to ac execute, it can be uh, can be detrimental. So we do that, but we only do it in complement to our mass email marketing. So much more, we send about 40,000 emails a month and we segment that into different, about 16 or 17 different campaigns. That is really predictable. We get over 20 meetings a month from it. And that allows us to do other testing on more ABM approach and be safer in our approach to do that. We can test more creatively. We can send screenshots, videos, but I'm, I'm only comfortable doing that once there's a, like a real strong foundation of predictability in place. Our other campaign, which I mentioned, which was pay to play for solution seekers and solution providers. We do that for two reasons. One, to f basically get market research because you can see people posting for stuff and you know exactly what they're looking for. And you can segment it by industry and department really well. So we use that for BD planning, strategic initiatives, investment reasons, who to hire, um, but also just lead gen. You know, we have our ICP, which is the same as our emails in our, in our three sectors. And you can tell right away from the solution for, uh, seeker if they're an ICP or not because they give you all the information up front and all you have to do is go and pay for it. So we have a ratio of the amount of meetings we take for lead gen versus the amount of meetings we take for planning and market research and just learning from the, the solution seeker um, what, what they're looking for and um, that will justify f future investments. So that's what we do with that channel and that's working really well for us. You have to have a good ch um, chunk of money behind it to make it work. If you're going to do it, do it well. Don't invest $5,000. Know, invest a decent amount of money and go for it for a year. Give it, give it six months to a year for you to really test its viability. Email marketing is much faster to test because you can, you can test per sequence. You get your data feedback loop is really, really quick. Pay to play, your data feedback loop is much slower. So give it a year to play out. The third channel, as I mentioned, was a content strategy and it to generate inbound leads from organic search. Um, eventually that'll be paid search, but at the minute it's organic. That's pretty new to us. Um, we've only been doing it for six, uh, not even six months, four months. It's the most successful, not in terms of the volume of leads we get, but in the conversion rate. The leads that we get from that channel tend to convert faster. They convert at a higher deal value. They're much more in line with our ICP because they already know what we do in terms of like they can read our content, they can read our website, they know exactly who we are, what we do, how we talk about ourselves, and they make a decision on that um, to fill in their email information and contact us. That channel doesn't generate a huge volume of leads, but it, the, the leads we get are really strong. Um, so that's really good for high deal values, uh, maybe half a million, million plus, they're, they're, they're good leads. I expect that number to grow in the next six to 12 months as we develop that channel. And the way we run it is we run it on a sprint, agile methodology, similar to development. So we plan a content backlog, similar to a product backlog. We put that into a um, spreadsheet. We then decide which of these content pieces we're going to produce over the month in an agile uh, framework. And then we just monitor the production schedule over the month. And we segment each, each content type into its different categories. You know, an article is one piece, a PR piece is another type, sales collateral is another uh, type. And then we've got um, what I call pillar, pillar pieces or lead magnets. You know, they're white papers, downloadable pieces, ebooks webinars, something that's more significant, requires more effort. So we have one, we develop one of those every so often. And then we have our articles that support it as well. Speaking of the uh, cold outreach, uh, that is uh, one of the um, most important, like main channels for you, you mentioned, uh, what trends did you notice lately um, in your niche uh, while doing cold outreach? Actually, there's three main things that I noticed with cold outreach for this particular industry. One, is what I mentioned at the very start around taking the risk out of the investment. There's a lot of people that we get who reply to us and say, have you got any experience in the real estate market building X, Y, and Z type of product? 
They want to know, have you done this before? Okay, so that's a number one piece of feedback that we get. And that's why targeting then is so important and choosing your sectors and your personas is really important. Otherwise, the customer doesn't know exactly who you sell to. And then they think you sell to everybody, which means you sell to nobody. Instead of dealing with it reactively, we proactively decided to target these types of people so that when we email those people, they already know that we do this. Okay, so we don't get that objection as much. So that's number one. Number two is there's a lot more people looking for data, um, analytics, and BI and business intelligence solutions. I don't think a lot of people know what they're asking for, <laughs> but they, uh, they're they asking for some sort of dashboard, centralized decision-making platform. We hear a lot of single source of truth terminologies. I don't, again, I don't really think they know what they're asking for, but it's certainly a trend that we're, that we're seeing a lot more of. Um, but what we're noticing as well is that companies, when they're saying, we, I want data, some of them are actually only asking for reporting. <laughs> you know, the, like when they say, some people, when they say data, they're actually saying, I just want to see my HubSpot, HubSpot reports in a central central location, or I want to see my Salesforce or in a, in a central place, even though they think it's data analytics, it's really just basic reporting. Um, so we're seeing a lot more of that. And that's good because at least people are asking and they're starting their data analytics journey and starting to mature um, into basic level reporting, then measuring re reporting against KPIs. Then K you can do some then uh, machine learning and analytics on top of that. Those are the two big ones that I've noticed. Great, cool. Uh, looking at the situation now compared to half a half year ago, how difficult it is to book a meeting with your potential customer? right now there's so many lead gen solutions out there now there's a lot of automation solutions everyone's using them i think particularly the last two years everybody's sending automated sequences it's a double-edged sword i've actually noticed that the quality of professionalism in terms of how business development and lead gen emails are written a lot more people's emails are really creative they're using screenshots they're using good business development techniques they're formatting and in I noticed that you you just received investment from X, Y, and Z. Here's what we do. Here's the four bullet points. But I actually see that as a problem because because so many people are doing it now. <laughs> so everyone's emails look the same. As a receiver, there's nothing different. Maybe your solution is different, but the, the way they look at it on the screen is starting to look the same and you become desensitized to that. So actually, it's actually getting harder to book the meeting. And there's actually some research on this that the number of activities per rep has increased, but the, the actual number of meetings that reps are booking has decreased on average. So you're actually having to do more steps to get the meeting. And that's a big challenge I think right now for people is how do you differentiate on what you say and how the email looks? You know, I've sent emails in the past where I've just said, I'm not gonna bore you with what I've, you know, you already know that the labor market is, it's, it's hard to hire people right now. You already know that. I'm not going to waste your time. I'm just going to get straight to it. We sell custom software solutions. This is our rate. This is what we do. Here's a screenshot of it. And it's literally done in like three lines. That's been working a little bit for us as well. Just being really super direct to get through the noise, especially if you're selling something that's, that's well understood. I don't think you need to ed educate somebody on the fact that it's really hard to hire developers right now. Everyone knows that. We all know it. So you don't need to go and give me the labor statistics from the latest gover government report. I know, I'm, I'm, I'm well aware. So just get straight to the point. So I'm trying to push for less form formality and more personalization. And not personalization from an automation perspective where it just grabs the company name or your LinkedIn profile. I mean, like, be personal, write like you would talk, basically. Type the email like you would speak. If there's a few grammar mistakes, I'm not saying that's great, but don't be so overly concerned with trying to write this perfectly scripted, really fancy words, all the right, like just get straight to the point, be really personable and talk, write the email like you would speak to somebody. I really love how you uh, talked about uh, write how you speak. I think that would be a massive takeaway from this interview and just, um, you know, in the wholesale community, that's a big message everyone should consider and 
think about. I'm curious, what's in your tech stack? What apps, uh, softwares do you use with your team uh, when you are working on sales? Zoom info, data research, and lead list, put it know for contact information, intent, um, and that's where we get all our lists. Then use a sales automation tool called uh, reply.io, which is an outreach tool, sales sequencing tool that helps build our, our sequences. And that's a really good tool because it allows us, we actually have about 17 different domains and email aliases because we don't want to burn our own health, our, our own domain. And reply.io is really good at helping us with that. Um, we also use HubSpot for our main domain sequences. Um, we don't send as many from there, but that we do use it for obviously just CRM purposes, inbound lead generation, lead scoring, um, uh, closing deals, but on our reporting, and we also send some sequences from it as well, but not as many as as uh, the other the other tool. Those are the main tools that we use, and we always we have, we have Confluence as well, which we use for storing our documentation and our strategic initiatives and our strategic training, our like training guides and playbooks and um, all document in all of our business planning initiatives. Great. Anthony, I would really like to know um, about the one advice or thought that helped you to boost your sales confidence, especially it will be really helpful to hear now since as you mentioned earlier, the competition is high. Uh, no matter whether you're in sales, in marketing, in other departments, no matter whether it's like a software outsourcing company or uh, other type of company, the competition is high everywhere and the confidence is a key uh, no matter what you're doing, what's your job. So the one advice or thought that helped you to boost your sales confidence? First one is I threw myself into the deep end early. So if you're going to do it, you you really go all in and do it and you make as many mistakes as quickly as possible um don't overthink it just get just start just get in and sell how you think you think you think you should sell and then realize that it's the wrong way but do it quickly and do it as fast as you can and do it as fast as you can and do it and throw yourself into the deep end don't overthink it um, that was one big piece of advice. When I was walking the streets, I was walking the streets every single day for over a year, walking into businesses and trying to, I mean, I remember times where I just, I didn't even leave, I I didn't leave the shop until I got a, a, a signature. <laughs> um, and I did, I got the signature in a lot of cases. If you overthink it and start reading all the, the, the I don't know, the, the right way to do it, straight away, I think it's really problematic to, you'll end up tripping yourself up because you'll start, try to follow and mold yourself into this script of what, how you should be. I think those things become useful after you've tried it yourself and thrown yourself into the deep end and, learn, and learned a little bit more about your own character, your own style, learn a bit more about what works for you. Um, for me, it's, you know, I talk really fast. I I have an Irish accent, so people believe what I'm saying. Um, so there's two things that work for me, and that, because I do believe what I'm saying. Maybe it's wrong, but I believe it, so other people might believe it too. The other thing is I do a lot of reading. I read broadly. I don't read narrowly, narrowly in the sense that I read the solution set, I'm selling, and, and that's my, okay, I've read one book, and now that's I'm going to stick with this forever. No, I read solution selling. I've read... Sander sales training. I went on boot camps. I've recorded myself live and had that sent to my manager. I went to Porto to do a sales training. I went to Copenhagen to do sales training. I went to uh, Gothenburg in Sweden to do sales training. And all of them were different. I read the Challenger sales book, which to me, out of all the books I've ever read, is probably the best sales book I've ever re I've read. Because it doesn't tell you doesn't necessarily say tell you to say this or ask these questions it tells you to learn your industry your market your customer your case studies industry trends and that and because you know all of that 
you're then able to tell the customer what they should be doing in a better way. That's why I like the Challenger sales book. So the best salespeople, in my point of view, are smart. And they're smart because they know their product, they know their industry, they know their persona, they know macroeconomic trends, they know business, they're, they're, they've got some business acumen, so they can talk to the customer with confidence about actually Miss, Mr. and Mrs. Customer, you, have you thought about doing it this way? I think that's the wrong way to do this. I think you can go in this direction, here's why. If you do it this way, you're gonna get this wrong. So that's why I like the Challenger Sales book. It imposes self, aggressive self-learning on the salesperson to go out of their way. And I think that's been the biggest benefit to me is, well, put it this way, last year I read 36 books. And a lot of them I don't go in with a mindset of, I need to learn this. I just read it. And then I see what was useful and then apply it in whatever context I'm working in. So just adopt a, just a learning mindset all the time. And once you do that, you just start reading books with no end goal per se of the book, just reading to learn, reading to learn. And over time, you just get really confident. You can talk about, as I said, economic policies. You can talk about business policies. You can talk about industry trends. You can talk about technology. You can talk about finance. You can talk about profit and loss. You can talk about psychology, you can talk, just if, and if you're diverse in all of those subjects, then you're never ever worried about the com- where the conversation's gonna go because you can talk about anything in any situation. So when I go into a call, honestly, I, I'm never nervous. doesn't matter whether it's the CEO of Disney or whether it's the CEO of a small business. I, f- I feel comfortable enough because I've, digested so much information and I've traveled the world, I've walked the streets, that con- that adds confidence. I can give you an anecdote. I was like 22 when I passed my driving test. In the first week I had my car, I drove 700 miles to a customer meeting. In, in Ireland, you have to have a like a, a sticker on your car to say you're restricted, so you can only drive 45 miles an hour. Um, I ended up turning the car sideways at one point. I drove on the wrong side of the road. I I started on the wrong side of the road, but I pulled onto the wrong slip road to go onto the motorway and started, I was facing oncoming traffic. I'm not saying do that, but what I did was I just jumped in. I got my car and within a week, I offered to drive to a customer and went and, and saw them. And we ended up getting a deal out of that. If you need to go see a customer, go see the customer. Whether it be virtual or in person, it doesn't really matter, but it's always better to just take, make the call, have the video call. Even if you're not prepared, just do it. I love it. I love this period, uh, this spirit and the energy coming from you, like coming from the experience and knowledge you, you gain. Uh, you are a really hard player. I, I see it and we all definitely can hear it by... Uh, everything you're sharing, sharing with us. What do you see uh, would be on the opposite side? Uh, what would be uh, one or a few things, uh, in your opinion, to avoid in sales, uh, especially in company? Uh, uh, let's stick to, to, to your industry, like yep. outsource. First thing to avoid is avoid the meeting and avoid the phone. I'm not saying cold calls are particularly successful for us, but if we get a request in a inbound form or a web form or somebody responds to our email what really upsets me is when somebody responds to that person in an email just pick up the phone because the email is usually to book a meeting but if you pick up the phone and respond to that person you can qualify it on the phone (laughs) in like 10 minutes without having actually to have the meeting because you've already had it on the phone. The meeting, the, the, the phone call can be the meeting and the follow-up activity all in one go. A lot of people don't do it anymore because email is so easy. It's emails almost become like a comfort blanket and it really annoys me. Another big thing to avoid is stop learning from a sales presentation and learn how to speak. If you can't sell it with no sales presentation, no demo, no collateral, then I I think you should only get those things once you've learned to tell the story. Standing 
on your own, on a call with nothing. Get up and talk and t- tell me why, like if I'm training a sales rep, tell me why all source is better than the com- com- competition. Because too many people read off this, the, the, they, they rely on a demo or they rely on a case study being developed and then they're putting pressure on marketing. Oh, can you give me this case study? Cause somebody went, or they, can you create this sales presentation for me? I don't have a, I don't have a sales deck. It's a comfort blanket. Like the demo is the close. The sales presentation is the close, not the opener. Because you're using a sales presentation often to convince someone. If you're using a sales presentation to convince somebody, then what, what are you actually doing? You're not really learning any skills that way. Uh, again, I can give you another anecdote. I had two speeches to give, or to give at two, two major conferences in the event space. I had to go from one conference to another conference. So I drove from one to the other. I got there. I was supposed to just be part of a panel and Basically, there was two other experts. There was a security expert and there was a health and safety expert and there was a city official and there was a police officer and they were given advice on the best way to organize an event. And I was just supposed to be there to say, yeah, and you can also use technologies to help in these scenarios. That's all. I was basically playing a small role. I got there. Two people didn't turn up on the panel. The two people who were left were really nervous and just threw this presentation at me and this is 20 minutes before it starts. There's 65 people sitting in the room and said, can you help us? Can you do this? I could have easily panicked because it was t- like I had 25 minutes to basically stand up and not just sell, but educate people on a subject that's quite serious, you know, health and safety, regulations, you know, sh- you know, there's a lot of, I mean, there's not a lot, but there's People are worried about shootings at festivals you know, in the United States, so you have to talk about you have to talk about those things. But going back to my point about being an aggressive self learner, this is a subject I should already know and should not need the presentation. So when I when I got the presentation, I was like, okay, just I just got rid of it and just sat it over in the corner, and I just got up and I just spoke about the subject that I should already know about. There was no presentation behind me, and it went and it went really well. People who were listening, they, all, they cared about what I had to say, not by how, whether the title on the slide was blue or whether it was white or whether it was green or whatever, the, how well it looked. They wanted to listen to someone, tell them or help them with something. And I was able to do that, I hope. Don't rely on your sales presentation. Don't rely on your demo. Rely on yourself first. And then once you're comfortable enough to do that, then you can start getting better at the, the presentation and the, the demo. That's a very beautiful approach. I like how you talked about emotions, like this comfort blanket uh, we have during our tough times. Uh, I think that one thing people uh, in sales also uh, usually forget or often forget is that uh, every tough moment, like all the emotions we experience during tough moments, they're temporary. No one is seeing yeah. this. No one can hear it. It's just you versus you and when you just you know overtake this fear and go and as you said you had 20 minutes before you stood up uh, and just started presentation when you overtake this fear or like this overthinking in your head uh during this uh which is led by you know emotions during your tough moments uh that's the moment which is dictating i mean or which is indicating that you are a really strong person no matter whether it's like in sales or uh in public speaking you know or in some other sphere of Um, your life another discipline exactly you know part of selling is actually selling internally like plant like getting people on the same page as you as how you want to position this with the customer and that's actually really hard but all the things i just mentioned apply to those circumstances you need to be able to convince internally that this is the right way to go all right, so before we wrap up our interview, is there anything I haven't asked you uh, that you might want to share with our audience about? Big thing for me is, and you asked me, it was about confidence. That is the biggest thing in sales is confidence, but it comes from knowledge and, inf- and being able to acquire information and digest it and then regurgitate it into a story. So the biggest thing for me in sales is be an aggressive self-learner. There's a very old mindset that tells people that they have to be this type of salesperson or this 
in a cell in this type of, like people who talk more are better salespeople or people who are loud are better salespeople or people who are very charismatic or better salespeople. I don't believe that's true. I believe the people who tell the best stories and who have the best information are the best salespeople. Because the information you're giving them adds value to the customer and that's all they care about. And the only way you can create value is by knowing something, holding, like having some knowledge that the customer may not know. Read constantly. Even if it's a book that you don't like, even if it's a book you don't even think you're going to learn something from, just read it. You might be surprised. Then you read another book. Then you read another book and another one and another one. So you might not. So a lot of time I, I hear from people saying, oh, I didn't really understand that book. Okay, the best way to understand that book is to read another one and then another one. And then it starts to come together. So if you want to be the best salesperson, not just the, the ordinary sales, the best salesperson, invest in yourself. Try to upgrade your, I don't want to say your intelligence, but your ability to learn. Just really, really learn as much as you can and come across as intelligent to the customer. And once you do that, everything else will fall into place. Perfect. Thank you so much for being with us here today, Anthony. No problem. Thanks, Carolina. If you enjoyed this episode, got valued or inspired out of it, share it with a fan. You can also follow our series by subscribing to the Time Camps channel on YouTube or directly on apps like Spotify or Google Podcasts. To make it even easier for you, we put all the links in the description below. Thank you so much, and I see you in the next one.